My name is Leanne Whitehouse. To begin with, I wish to acknowledge the Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first inhabitants of this nation and the traditional custodians of the lands where we live, learn, love and prosper. I am proud to announce that I have lived with traumatic brain injury for the past 30 years, an invisible injury to most. To be as inclusive as possible to those with sight impairments, please let me describe myself. I am a tall, sandy blonde, 52 year old white Caucasian woman wearing a blue dress and dark prescription glasses, nervously reading from a script. I desire to thank all the people who helped collaborate and make this series of brain injury awareness events happen. Tanya Ashton, who is here with us today on behalf of ABIOS, the Acquired Brain Injury Outreach Service, the Princess Alexandra Hospital in Brisbane, the STEPS Group, facilitators and members, my family and friends who have had to live with me agonising over wording this presentation. <laughs> and lastly, the Eleonora Library for accepting my proposal for Brain Injury Awareness Week and encouraging me to talk here today. This is the first public speech I've done about brain injury awareness and it's a huge challenge for me. Let me start with a brief history about myself. 30 years ago, my life permanently changed when I was involved in a horrific car accident that should have taken my life. I suffered horrendous multiple internal injuries, shredded intestines and bowels, broken bones, plus a severe traumatic brain injury that went undiagnosed for 25 years. I went from being an independent surfing health nut and a young insurance professional to being totally dependent, unemployable, non-confident, hollow shell of a person overnight. At that time, I was simply diagnosed with bruising to the stem of the brain. Six years ago, with the advances in medical technology, I was officially diagnosed with traumatic brain injury. But even now, not all brain injuries are visible. Today, I wish to talk about a couple of normal everyday events that most people can relate to. I will then compare them to my life, but to do so, I need to take off the veil and reveal some of my vulnerabilities to expose what life is really like for me. Now I'm blushing. <laughs> My memory challenges mean I have zero chance of remembering most of what I want to share with you today. That is why I will constantly refer to my script. My aphasia means I will most likely stumble often with my words, even when reading from my script. My sight impairments mean I wear these special glasses to reduce visual overload from bright flashing lights. In my life, I must manage dozens of other invisible challenges. I must state that each brain injury survivor and their level of challenges are unique to that individual. I can only express how I personally manage my challenges. Brain injury is rehabilitation for life. Okay. Let's start with everyday life example number one. I am mum to two teenage boys. How many other parents do we have here today? Lots of us. <laughs> Taking the kids to the movie is a favourite family pastime, right? Most people easily decide what movie they want to watch, what suburb it's showing at, jump in the car and go enjoy the movie with some popcorn or whatever treats they choose on that day. For me, it's taken 30 years of trial and error to develop a system that makes a trip to the movies seem relatively normal and enjoyable. Let's start with my first challenges. 
fatigue and short-term battery life. A simple 20-minute drive to the movies takes a big toll on my fatigue and cognitive skill levels before I even get there. I generally need to choose a movie in the 10 a.m. to midday time slot if I'm going to be driving. That can be very limiting to what you want to watch. The next challenge is my short-term memory issues. Often a movie will end with the plot being tied back to something that started at the beginning of a movie. Most times I'm left stunned not understanding why the movie has ended. It is because I do not remember what happened at the beginning of the movie. It is true I can watch a movie 50 times and depending on the complexity of the plot, I can still be surprised at the ending. Now I've lost my spot. <laughs> However, most TBI survivors, including me, really do get tired of hearing comments that minimise our experiences. Jokes like, it must feel like Groundhog Day, or you're like Lucy in 50 First Dates, simply are not as comical as the movie was. The next challenges I face are the sights and sounds in a movie theatre. These special Eileen glasses filter out colours that overstimulate my brain. They smooth out the flashing lights, bright, bright glares and explosive images that give a movie its big impact. For very similar reasons, I need to wear earplugs at the movies. Some of those explosive, big impact sounds have a huge physical toll on me, sending my hearing challenges into overdrive, inducing headaches, nausea, and mild audio trauma. The next challenge I face is cognitive. All those sights, sounds, people talking, action, inaction, subtle unspoken innuendos and body gestures. My brain injury means that I really have great difficulty pulling all that together into an enjoyable viewing experience with the family. One of the best things I've learnt in the past six years is that I can't follow movies without closed captions. I recently enjoyed a movie at Pacific Fair, the remake of Dumbo. I had to leave my driver's licence at the front desk in exchange for a special closed caption Wi-Fi unit that attached to the drink holder. I was able to experience and comprehend many more great moments of the movie with my kids. The final challenge is when the movie is over and my horrible short-term memory kicks in and I have to locate the car. In the past, I've often spent more time looking for the car than watching the actual movie. These days, I have developed a system that no matter where I go, I park the car in exactly the same car space every time. In some places, it's far too busy and confusing for me. In these cases, my favourite car parking space will be two blocks away. Then I walk. To really add to the complexity, if my favourite spot is taken and I don't have a passenger with me to help remember where the car is parked, I will abort that task altogether and go back home. Living with the undiagnosed TBI means a lot of things had to change for me. Conversations changed, relationships changed, and thoughts about myself and my capabilities changed. I had to constantly express how difficult it is to function while being expected to keep up with everyday interactions. I had to learn to say, this is too much for me in a noisy room, then deal with being asked, why are you being so irritated? For many decades, I did not understand that my brain was being overstimulated from noise, people and lights. I was constantly frustrated with myself over simple things that became hard to process. It's like not being able to count your cards playing canasta or strategizing during a game while others impatiently wait. 
I had to develop a thick skin due to feeling embarrassed when I repeated something that I'd said five minutes ago or when I forgot full conversations that happened yesterday. I purposely type files about people in my life to help build long-term conversations and to disguise my short-term memory. This never helped me. I couldn't remember the words or ideas I'd written beforehand. As I age gracefully, the statement, I have such a bad memory too, is becoming more and more used in an attempt to be compassionate and make me feel included. Unfortunately, most people have no comprehension of the depth of cognitive dysfunction regarding most brain injuries. Living with my brain injury is like struggling through every interaction while choosing to have hope that things will get better. It is being embarrassed, frustrated and overwhelmed all at the same time and deciding to show up anyway. I was a sleeping passenger in a motor vehicle accident back in 1988 when I received major damage and trauma to many regions of my brain, including the brain stem, the cerebrum, and my frontal lobe. The frontal lobe, that's this bit here, it's supposed to be both sides, but mine's injured on the right side. <laughs> the frontal lobe is the area of the brain that figures out how to put the big picture together and makes all the big decisions. When functioning optimally, the frontal lobe plans and stores all the information, helps you learn from your mistakes, helps you work out how to do things, helps you adapt to new situations, controls emotions and helps develop our personality, controls our activity and movement, helps us get along with people, helps with motivation, controls our speech, stops us from doing risky things. Our frontal lobe is a CEO executive of our brain. Okay, let's move on to everyday life example two. I'm much more than a brain injury survivor and a mother. I'm a surfer, a crafter, a businesswoman, a loving spouse, a volunteer, a brain injury awareness advocate, and like every person in this building, I'm so much more than just a short list of titles. The frontal lobe is the area of the brain that juggles all of these different aspects of our lives. For those without a brain injury, this CEO function of our brain happens in real time, often without conscious thought. It is called everyday life choices and decisions. The injury to my frontal lobe means my brain short circuits frequently while trying to change tasks, make decisions, or big picture plans. I was having huge challenges taking everything into consideration and then having to make all those CEO decisions. A significant change in my life is when I asked my loving partner and carer to be my frontal lobe proxy. Basically, I desired the CEO section of my brain not to have to make all those major decisions. You can only imagine how vulnerable a request that was to ask, along with all the trusted entails. When we learn something new, we create new neural pathways. Our brain rewires itself to adapt to changes in our circumstances. For a long time, it was believed that we were bestowed with a finite amount of brain cells at birth, and these sl cells slowly die over time. We know now that our brain has incredible regenerative capabilities. Utilising this approach to brain injury recovery to reconnect, regrow and replenish cells can be powerful therapy. Neuroplasticity is something to be hold. The right hand side of my brain 
was damaged 30 years ago. And for 24 years, I relied on the left-hand side of the brain to pull me through. When I was finally diagnosed, my treatment started to rebuild new pathways in the right side of my brain. Now that I'm aware, I don't neglect either side of my brain. I'm constantly relearning how to work with both sides. I love this quote. You can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. C.S. Lewis. I employ a variety of lifestyle choices that has helped with my personal brain injury. First and foremost is to reduce and manage stress. The story I just told about my frontal lobe proxy is a huge example of this. The second lifestyle choice is to exercise every day. Walk, surf, do what my heart desires. Generally, get out into nature. When I do these things, I receive an abundance of serotonin and oxytocin, which are natural brain drugs that calm the scenes and heighten the mind. The third choice is to sleep as much as I need. A lot of experts suggest that a normal person should sleep for a minimum of eight hours a day. I only have six to eight hours of energy per day and need 10 to 18 hours of sleep per night due to my short battery life. When you are sleeping, you are regenerating your frazzled brain. The best way I can describe my TBI is to compare it to a phone battery. When your phone hits 20%, the power seems to drain exponentially. This is exactly what happens to me. Sometimes I can feel it or sense it. Other times, friends or family will pick up on it and help me find a place to rest. The fourth lifestyle choice is to interact with real people as often as possible. It's okay to text, but more powerful to have a two-way conversation. When I started the STEPS program back in 2016, I communicated predominantly via text, email or social network. I completely lost my voice. Joining the STEPS program and meeting others with brain injury once a month has been a powerful experience for me. The STEPS program is a free outreach program for people with brain injury that live in Queensland. Through showing up to network events and getting to speak to strangers who gradually became friends, my communication skills have continually expanded. I was honoured to be offered to train as a STEPS leader last year and completed the training. Early this year, I had the privilege to co-host my first STEPS program with Tanya as a STEPS group peer leader. The fifth lifestyle choice is to spend at least 30 minutes in the sunshine each day. Living on the Gold Coast is generally fairly easy, except when we experience periods of rain. The sixth and final lifestyle choice is when I have negative thoughts. Distractions is my saviour. I do an engaging activity. If I need to, I'll get to a group. If I'm not able to get to a group, I read a fantasy book. I can take, that can take me out of my head. In addition, surfing is my savior. Jumping into the cold ocean in the middle of winter really brings you to the, into the now. And you can notice all of your senses. One day, I suddenly, I woke to the fact that due to my brain injury, I tend to fall into deep depression. I've brought along my black dog, who I call Deb. To help me function, I created my own mindfulness game where I would sit Deb on my combi console and look at his cute little face and virtually hand over all my sadness and depression. Look at his back. He's got a faded sunstripe from sitting on my console for so long. 
I hope you all get the gist of how I remove negativity from my world by transferring it to this little fella. He just sits there and absorbs it. Every once in a while, when I pull up to a nice beach or natural blissful place, I'll get Depp out of the combi and metaphorically tell him to release all of that darkness and sadness from his body and empty it all out. It might sound weird, but hey, it works for me. And I would like to round up by sharing one last phrase I live by. Ability is what you are capable of doing. Motivation determines what you will do. And attitude determines how well you will do it. I would like to express my appreciation and gratitude to everyone that came to support me today. I hope you gained a little insight into brain injury challenges and I encourage you to spread brain injury awareness in your world. If you would like to learn more about my personal brain injury advocacy work, you can check my Leanne Whitehouse Inspires pages on Facebook and YouTube. I'm sure the STEPS coordinator, Tanya, would like to make a couple of comments. I would just um, say a big thank you to Leanne. I, I, yes, thank you. Um, I had the privilege of, of having um, a copy of that before, but it was much more powerful listening to the spoken words. Um, so well done. That was, thank that was you. just amazing. <laughs> Um, and I think that being brave and vulnerable to be able to stand there and share um, your life, as you said, and, and having to sort of put that guard down. And there was a few sort of comments that I made um, while I was sitting there listening to it, and I'll just have to find them quickly. But um, you could really see in that, in that talk that Leanne shared about how much insight she's developed over the years about her brain injury and therefore the self-management um, so, and self-management is what the STEPS program is all about, um, so it links just beautifully. And I suppose we do try and seek peer leaders who have that sense of self-management. So it's been a very good fit for Leanne to become a peer leader with the STEPS program. And I think the other thing that I also sort of noted was about that fatigue that Leanne talked about. So cognitive fatigue, which is much different to physical t fatigue, you know, where we get physically tired from doing something. And I really like that analogy of the phone. So we've, most of us have mobile phones now and as that sort of starts to drain down, sometimes you know that, sometimes others have to be able to sort of alert you to that. And certainly that's something that others have shared with me they may pick that cognitive fatigue up, they may not. Um, and so that's where having a support network around you. And I think that's very much what you've done. In developing your own sense of who you are, you've educated the people around you who can then support you. Um, so as Leanne was saying, my role is um, coordinator with the STEPS program. We run across the state, we're part of Queensland Health. Um, we're a free program and we offer um, six-week group programs and then ongoing networks of support. So adults who've had a brain injury and are now aged between 18 and 65. So really sort of looking at that well, working age range, but that's getting much higher now. And so the focus was, when it started about 11 years ago, was to be able to connect people together. We found that people came out of hospital or finished their rehab and felt quite disconnected and isolated. So that's where it's grown. And we've now got about 25 groups that run across the state and we probably have you know, 500 members and 50 active volunteer leaders. Um, and so it's, it's been something that our program wouldn't run without um, volunteers like Leanne. There's only two paid staff, and as I said, probably 50 active volunteers. Um, so certainly we appreciate you coming along today, um, appreciate sort of listening to Leanne's story, and I think 
rightly so, we all can have a role then in brain injury awareness. So you might take a couple of messages away today that help you to sort of talk about it in your sort of world and your community. Um, so thank you again to Leanne. And are there any questions that people would like to ask or anything that you'd like to share perhaps from your own experience as well? I think the step is a bit of... Yeah, 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 yeah. Go, go for it. <laughs> step programs has occurred since my injury. Yes. And mine was, gosh, almost 20 years ago. Now. Yeah. And it's occurred, and it's, I wasn't aware of it then. I was very lucky to have family support that's absolutely excellent. Um, but I would be interested in getting more people who've had injuries as well, because as you see, people always say, as soon as you see, oh, my, my, I've got a bad injury, say, oh, my, my brain's straight, I have to address it as well. It's very, very annoying. Yeah. Not annoying, but it's like, <laughs> and I think, yeah, real. <laughs> yeah, and I think that was really powerful in what you said, because it helped to, because what it feels like then is that you are, um, dismissing the realities of what you're mm. living with with a brain injury. As yeah. horrendous as it sounds, it's all someone's blind mm. and can't see. Mm. And, someone said, and then someone says, to me, I always have to cross the road. It's like, yeah, but get real. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's different. Sick. It's yeah. very different and acknowledging that. And look, I'd, I'd encourage anybody who's interested in getting involved with STEPS. So the, the sort of eligibility is around being 18 to 65 now that you experienced <laughs> your brain injury um, as an adult, and that really means 16 and above. Um, only because we find that when you have a brain injury as a child, it interrupts those usual child development milestones, and the outcome can be different. And so we don't have the expert um, expertise in that area, so we look to somebody else. And apart from that, it's, it's really feeling that you, you'd like to connect with others. Um, the groups are often small deliberately, so that we choose, you know, so that they're not as overwhelming as you might think. And everybody in those groups either has a brain injury or is supporting somebody with a brain injury. So we're actually um, hoping, well, we are going to be running a skills program starting next week on the Gold Coast. Um, and that's the six week group program. It runs two hours each week. And each week there's a different topic of information discussed. So we, we provide a whole sort of range of information and resources. Sorry. <laughs> Joe. Um, so yeah, definitely. And you're, you're right that uh, STEPS has only been around for 11 years. And I think Leanne has found, certainly over the last sort of 20 to 30 years, how you know, many more services have come on board and that hopefully we're starting to sort of reduce the gaps. Um, and so, and I think, would you say that um, even though your injury is, you know, many years ago, there was still benefit in coming and doing the STEPS program Oh, now? terrific benefit. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. So we do find it doesn't matter. Sometimes we have people who are, had their injury 12 months ago or 30 years ago. Okay, so that doesn't make a difference in, the, in what you might gain from the program. Yeah, so we do have some pamphlets that I can easily give you which has some details and then I can get your contact details and email you some more. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? No? Okay. Thanks everyone for coming. And until next time, thank you everybody. Have an awesome week. Bye. <laughs>